This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. And welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording today from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today in Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk exclusively about the Newfoundland dog, a dog who has saved humans throughout all of history. All right, let's go. when I do these episodes, I find a few stories that have entertained me or were interesting for some reason or another, but they might not have a whole lot of cohesion. There might be a few exceptions. There was the All Cat special a few weeks ago, trying to cater to, well, the entire internet because the internet was made for cats and, well, one other thing. We also did a political animal special during the United States National Election Week and an intentional all bird special with swearing birds and birds who set things on fire. That was fun. Those cheeky birds. And one unintentional all bird special a few weeks ago with the murder crows and Nikola Tesla's pigeons. But, you know, generally speaking, there is very little rhyme or reason for these episodes. But I'm a dog trainer, and I would be completely remiss if I didn't at least cave to my own curiosity at least once. So I thought I would do an all dog special to welcome spring. Most of us with dogs are going to be outside more often now that it's nicer. And hey, dogs are the bee's knees. And y'all know how much I love bees. And if you don't, well, welcome to the party. Look at the logo. So today we are going to dedicate this time to dogs of history. And as I was looking, there was one dog that really just kept popping up, the Newfoundland. And you're going to learn all about the Newfoundland dog and how they've intersected with history, with medicine, with all of it. This dog is amazing. It's, it's a domesticated bear of sorts and a canine body. They're amazing and wonderful and... Well, you're just going to have to wait and hear all about it. You ready? Let's go. Okay, have you ever seen a dog the size of a small bear jump out of a helicopter into the ocean? No? Well, then you have not met Reef, a Newfoundland dog in Italy who works with her owner, Ferruccio Pelinga. Everywhere he goes, Reef goes. Restaurants, vacation, hotels the middle of the ocean, everywhere. I'm not sure if this is just Italy being awesome because, one, it is awesome. I've been there and they allow dogs everywhere. Or, two, because Reef is a special lady. She's a trained water rescue dog who, as mentioned up at the top, jumps out of helicopters to save people. See, brought it back full circle. In fact, Reef is even a teacher of sort at Ferruccio's Italian School for Rescued Dogs, which I thought was a school for homeless dogs, but no, it's something way cooler. It's a school for dogs who rescue people from danger. How cool is that? So question, how did Ferruccio decide to get Reef and start such a project? Well, it turns out he's been running this school for over 30 years. It takes about a year to train a motivated dog who wants to do this work to the point where he or she can apply and train for the license. So you still need to get your dog to be able to do the basics, sit, come, pay attention, things like that, and get used to the equipment like the flotation devices that the dog have to wear or the leashes and the rescue equipment that the dogs have to carry and also carrying all of your weight behind them. And this will make sense in a minute. So if you have a dog who doesn't like water, people, activity, training, this is not going to be the job for your dog. It takes about three years of training from the beginning to the end. 
and many very, very, very good boys and who's a good girls completely flunk out of this program. Presently, there are about 400 licensed rescuing dogs who help the Italian Coast Guard in the summer, and there's a dedicated canine lifeguard unit. Well, how do they help? The owners and their dogs volunteer. Yep, you don't make any bank doing this work. They stand on assigned beaches, which, you know, standing on an Italian beach actually sounds quite lovely right now with my dog. But if a boat goes under or someone gets pulled out to sea with a riptide, the dog goes in. One dog can pull six people through the water. And remember this in our next story. The dog and human are a team and they rescue people together. So when the dog swims out for a rescue, say a capsized boat, if the human were to swim out the whole way, he or she would be so tired by the time they got there, they wouldn't be able to effectively help at the watery scene. So instead, the dog can pull the human to the scene using the dolphin technique. This is where the owner handler holds onto a harness of the dog and goes essentially for a ride out into the ocean. This allows the human to save energy. And when they get to the scene, the human can instruct or help or communicate and the dog, again, as I said before, can pull up to six people back to shore. These dogs together save about 3,000 people every year. And using Newfoundlands like Reef for this kind of work is something that just didn't happen by accident. After years of breeding this breed for a purpose, the Newfoundland is a dog that was initially bred to help fishermen in, you guessed it, Newfoundland, Canada. They are huge, sweet, loyal, and strong. <laughs> but lots of dogs are huge, sweet, loyal, and strong. What makes these guys so good in the water? Good enough to be called the lifeguard dog. Well, they have two things in their favor. The first is webbed feet. This makes it much more efficient for them to swim longer distances without using quite as much energy. And two, they have a very, very, very thick coat that keeps them warm even when they're wet. So let's use that information as we dive into our next story of a dog in the 1800s and in his quest to save 200 shipwrecked people in a very angry ocean. It's 1828 off the coast of the Isle aux Morts. Literally means Island of the Dead in French. Yeah, this isn't foreboding at all. It's a small rocky section of Canada facing the Atlantic that earned its name from the many shipwrecks off the coast, loss of life, and turbulent water. In such places, children used bunches of small patent desks and cabinet keys that swept to land as toys. I would prefer Legos, while their father spent days burying corpses. Life in the 1800s in coastal towns like this wasn't easy, and definitely less easy if you're wearing a dozen petticoats, but that did not stop 17-year-old Anne Harvey and her trusty friend, a Newfoundland dog named Harry Mann. He performed one of the most heroic rescues I've ever heard of. Anne and her father, George, were fishing on the rocks when they noticed some things floating in the water. When they identified a keg and a straw bed bobbing in the sea, they knew instantly that a ship had to have been wrecked nearby. Anne ran to get her 12-year-old brother, Tom, and their dog, Harry Mann. They raced in their old-timey clothing to the rocks and scrambled into a square-bottomed boat without a motor. This is called a punt. And to push a punt boat forward, one uses a long rod instead of a traditional oar, and you push against the bottom of the river or shallow water to get to where you need to go. Tom, Anne, and her dad, and their Newfoundland, not a small dog, these dogs typically weigh between 120 and 176 pounds. That's bigger than I am, and I am an adult human. All of them were crammed into the punt, pushed off in search of the wreckage. They knew it was going to be bad, and it was. Nearby, there were six survivors on a beach. They pointed further out, and knowing that they were going to find more survivors or worse, they pushed on, eventually getting to a rock Three miles away, crowded with over a hundred people barely fitting on the rock. Many had already been swept away at sea. They drowned or they died from exhaustion or dehydration because you can't drink salt water. And from this point forward, the rock became known as Wreck Rock. That's not good. 
Before we go on, let's learn about the people stranded on Wreck Rock. The ship named the Dispatch left Derry, Ireland on May 29th. This brig was carrying about 200 Irish immigrants and 11 crew members to their new home in Quebec, Canada, when a storm hit on July 10th. This was two days before Anne and her dad George saw the floating straw bed in the sea. These immigrants had been on the dispatch for over a month already, and they were so close to land only to be caught in a storm and freedom. It turns out that before the potato famine in Ireland in the 40s, immigrants in the 20s from Ireland were majority men, while during the famine and after, early families and majority women came to what was known as the New World. Though we all know that there have been indigenous people here long before the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and certainly long before the dispatch. So new? is in the eye of the historian. So it's 1828, and now there are over 100 immigrants stranded on a rock that is not big enough for anyone to even lay down. The sea is bashing these people and threatening them to stay on the rock and die of starvation or dehydration, or jump into the water to get into the punt that they cannot get within 100 feet from the shipwrecked because of the turbulent conditions. Nor can they fit all the people in this boat. So what do they do? They would do what we've all been doing over the last year. Look at the tools you have and do the best you can with those tools. Well, the Harveys had a boat. They had a house on the mainland to get these people to safety, but they didn't have helicopters. They didn't have a full Navy that could be there in minutes. The rescue, even if they had flagged for help, would take days and they didn't have time to waste. But they also had a Newfoundland dog named Harry Mann. With a moment of quick thinking, George threw a rope tied to some wood towards the rock and got Harry Mann, a Newfoundland, to swim for it as the waves crashed and churned and have people hold on to his bear-like body while Harry Mann swam back to the punt. Throw, swim, carry, unload. Throw, swim, carry, unload into the boat. The Harveys would then push the rod into the bottom of the sea push all the weight of these starving, exhausted people, push them back three miles to the mainland, have the kids escort, carry, drag however they could, get the shipwreck into their modest home where they were already in July preparing for winter. Because stocking cupboards with extra flour, brined fish, whatever they could, because winters in this part of the world and at this time in history were harsh. The land is harsh, and every minute is thinking not just for the day, like Amazon shipping an emergency game of Animal Crossing, which may or may not have happened in our home recently, but really truly thinking ahead. George had eight kids, a wife, and nearly 200 pounds of dog. Houses were not built like they were today, with everyone in their own room and people shared spaces back then, small footprints of houses, and candlelight for dinner conversations before bedtime. And now, there were shipwrecked people coming to land by the dozens, and they kept coming. And Harry Mann, Anne, Tom, and George pushed the punt out from the Al Omort to Wreck Rock, had Harry Mann swim out, fighting against the current, the very sea itself, and carry people back to the punt and back to shore for three days, 24 hours a day. Anne's years in the fishery had helped her develop courage and the ability and the physical strength. She would have been a skillful woman with the oars and knowledgeable about the local waters and navigation hazards, and she had used this all the time handling for fish. She was quite capable and dependable as a crew member, and it's unlikely that young 12-year-old Tom would have spent sufficient time at sea to have reached that status. And I'd argue having a dog drag you to the island of the dead, and that's your safest option? That's not comforting. That's the worst name for the safest place to be, ever. One account mentions a Scottish mom, Ms. Arnott, with an infant wrapped around her in a shawl. She clenched the shawl in her teeth to free her hands and bravely made the tenuous passage to the dory. This shawl is still held by the Arnott family. From Sunday morning until Tuesday, Harry Mann pulled 180 people off of Wreck Rock. George and Anne pulled 180 people to shore. 
The six other children and townsfolk gathered people and brought them literally hell or high water to the Harvey's home, and they waited. They waited on the island of the dead for help to come, but it took days. The survivors who were in the best condition were able to help Anne and the villagers build lean-tos for shelter, but the immigrants were in terrible, terrible condition. The Harveys and the townsfolk had few resources and not enough food, but they did their best. They did their best for over a week. By the time rescue came in the form of the HMS Tyne, led by Captain Grant, it was noted that there was no flour, no tea, nothing at all left in the Harvey home to eat. Their bread had been eaten days before, and there was nothing left in their winter stores either. Captain Grant left provisions, and he was able to get the survivors, 158 passengers of 200, and nine crew survived onto the Tyne. He got them to Halifax. Word of the heroism of this family, especially Anne and Harry Mann, unsurprisingly spread through Canada. They were given, at the time, a huge sum of money for their efforts, and their winter stores were eventually replaced and replenished, and the family was honored by a medal from the Royal Humane Society, which I thought was an animal rescue, but it's not. It's the British charity known to promote life-saving intervention. It was founded as the Society for the Recovery of Persons Apparently Drowned, as a way to teach people about the first aid in cases of near drowning and to get resources to towns in order to educate people and help them from, you know, not dying in water. Over time, this branched out into mine safety and recognized people for bravery, putting themselves at great risk to save others. And Anne was presented this medal with the recognition that without her efforts, all 200 passengers and 11 crew would have died and been swept to sea. But... As is so often the case in history, the medal bore George's name only, not hers. Girls could be recognized, sort of, for hard work, but not fully, not publicly. The media said, quote, a fisherman in a small boat was the savior for the crew. Even Archdeacon Wicks, two years after the shipwreck, who prevented the medal to Anne in the fall of 1830, never referred to her by name. As so many girls and women of the time, and yes, even today, she was only known as the, quote, first mate or crew member of George Harvey, quote, the daughter of George Harvey. And in 1930, she was promoted to the wife of Charles Guillaume. Paul. So Anne and Harry Mann saved 180 people from the unforgiving rock, nursed, clothed, and fed, and comforted 167, buried 13 people, and went on with life as it was fishing and planting and wearing petticoats, getting married and having kids of her own, continuing on as a rocking beast of a woman, surviving on the rocks like a boss, known only in print as the relationship to some man or another, but Anne, a full actual human being in her own right, wasn't even done saving people. Ten years later, the Rankin, a ship from Glasgow, had been shipwrecked near the exact same spot of the dispatch. I can just see her saying to herself, ah, not again. So she hiked up her petticoat and went back to work. Quote, she struck on the rock and went to pieces, the crew hanging onto an iron bar or a rail that went around the poop. As in poop deck. As in, yes, the deck you poop on. The crew were taken off six or eight at a time in a punt, rowed through the heavy surf by Anne and her father. Though Anne's involvement was not mentioned in the media outlets of the time, she is identified by the Northern Shipwrecks database as the rescuer of the Rankin the same source that names George Harvey as the only rescuer of the dispatch. Something, as you now know, was absolutely not possible or true. Little is known about Anne after this second shipwreck. Anne has also been recognized as the, quote, Grace Darling of Newfoundland, an honor bestowed upon an absolute boss lady in each colony of the British Empire. So why was she called the Grace Darling? 
Well, this was after the heroic exploits of the daughter of a lighthouse keeper in England, who at age 22 rescued nine people from the sinking steamship, the Forfarshire. Which is incredible. I'm not debating that. But Anne and Harry Mann and the Harvey family saved 167 people a decade before the efforts of Grace Darling. So really, Grace Darling, an absolute hero, should have been called the Anne Harvey of Bamberg. Anne eventually died in Port Obosk in 1860 at the young age of only 49. There's a festival now in her honor called the Anne Harvey Days Festival, a several-day-long festival of traditional food, probably fried food too, sure, folk art events, dancing, weaving, buying all sorts of things. There's a cafe called the Harry Mann Cafe in the Allo Mort, And in 1987, the Canadian Coast Guard commissioned the CCGS Anne Harvey. And this ship patrols the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland. There is the Anne Harvey Nature Trail at at Al Omor, which evidently has lots of great hiking places. So if you're looking for a place to be outside and socially distant, go to Canada. I mean, not Americans, though. We're still kind of grounded because we really messed up this whole COVID thing. But... When we are finally let out of our rooms and other countries let us come back out and play, we should totally go to Isle O'More for some hiking. There's also a book by Kevin Major, quote, As Near to Heaven by Sea, and the chamber opera Anne and Seamus based on Kevin Major's book. I'm hopeful that rebel girls or rejected princesses will do a story on her someday. I would just love to see her and Harry Mann illustrated and their stories done in just those ways. So it seems like more than a century after her death, she got recognized as a full person. But in life, she was only ever known as she related to other people. She was the mother of eight children. She was George Harvey's daughter, part of the fisherman's crew, the wife of Charles Guillaume, the Grace Darling of Newfoundland, and her gravestone is unmarked. heard of Napoleon, and I'm sure you have too. Little guy, big hat, got kicked out of France, went to Elba, and that's pretty much all I knew. I work with dogs, so when I work with little dogs like Chihuahuas, the owners almost always say, he's got a Napoleon complex. He thinks he's bigger than he really is. After losing his country to other countries, ugh, colonizing is the worst, she says, in America. Napoleon was exiled to Elba. A teeny island off the coast of Italy, but because he was so Napoleon-freaking-Bonaparte, emperor of France and certified war hero if you're into that sort of thing, he was given sovereignty of Elba and got to keep his title as emperor. That's not bad, given that exile is usually the word for, and don't let the door hit you on the way out. After just a couple of months on the island in exile where they thought he would just sort of not be a problem anymore, get sad, and maybe disappear into the dark night, he instead created a small army, a small navy, developed mines for iron, made roads happen, completely overhauled both the legal and education systems, and then when he was kicking his feet up, exiling like a boss, he made decrees on how agriculture should work more efficiently. So I don't think he read How to Be Exiled for Dummies, and his captors didn't read any of the 72 pages of written source notes on old-timey Wikipedia about Napoleon Bonaparte. In this relationship of captor and captive, I don't think they did the work to make this relationship work, and their expectations of themselves and others were on totally different pages. Different books, even. If it were today, I am pretty sure Napoleon's captors wanted a nice, chill, easygoing captive that they would have swiped left on Napoleon, knowing what they do now. I mean, everyone in this story is super dead now, but I think you get what I'm saying. They would have passed him up for an easier captive. So it's surprising to literally no one that Napoleon escaped Elba on a brig called the Inconstant, and off they went. Not long into this escape from Elba, rough seas kicked up. If you thought that meteorology was a hit or miss today, imagine what it was like in 1800s. 
Anyway, short story, Napoleon gets knocked over into the sea, and that should have been the end of it for Napoleon, but it wasn't. A nearby fisherman had his trusty Newfoundland dog on a fisherman's boat, and the dog instinctively jumped into the sea. This unnamed history dog kept Napoleon afloat until he could reach safety. Not much happened to Napoleon after that escape, but had he died at sea and sunk, we wouldn't get this nugget in the Wikipedia page that I was definitely not expecting while researching a story on dogs. Quote, Shortly after death, an autopsy was conducted. The doctor conducting the autopsy cut off several of Napoleon's body parts, including his penis. I'm really not sure why this was necessary, except for maybe at the time there had been a lot of money and people getting Napoleon Bonaparte's body parts. Or maybe just a morbid fascination. Or maybe this autopsy guy was someone who was enacting revenge on Napoleon for any number of wartime conquering deaths, etc., that he was ultimately responsible for. Either way, without that dog, Napoleon would have just had an at-sea burial completely, well, intact. Thanks to the newbie, I got the best surprise line in a Wikipedia article that I have ever, ever got. So thank you, unnamed Nufi. Your heroism knows no bounds. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, share and tell your friends. It is truly the best way to support the show. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals in the news, if you happen to know where Napoleon Bonaparte's body parts are, go ahead, send them in. Email at bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, DM or voice text on bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, or lurk at bewilderbeast on Instagram. As always, I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this show. So go get curious. I got today's information about Newfies and the Italian Coast Guard from abcnews.com and mymodernmet.com. The Shipwreck, Wikipedia on Anne Harvey, the Isleomore.ca, Newfoundland and Labrador.com, Trip Ideas, Travel Stories, and the Shipwrecks of Newfoundland and Labrador, Block.gov, Classroom Materials on Immigration on Irish Immigration to America, Wikipedia.org on the Royal Humane Society, Isleomore.ca, and the Dispatch.wordpress.com. And on our little buddy Napoleon, CNN.com, Wikipedia on the Newfoundland Dog, Wikipedia on Napoleon, and the Good News Network on how Napoleon was saved from the ocean. Links are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by NK2. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Bye.